So good morning. Thank you very much for introducing me. And I want to thank the organizers for this very important conference. I'm very glad to be here. Can you hear me well? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my topic today is the musical representations of Ukraine in the Gulag, the Soviet forced labor camps. Some authors have described the Gulag as a condensed mirror image of Soviet society, as a small zone in which the phenomena of Soviet life can be studied as under a magnifying glass. Consequently, the study of the use and function of Ukrainian music in the Gulag also promises insight into the treatment of Ukrainian music within the big zone that is the Soviet Union. Gulag prisoners made music both on command and on their own. Music on command was rooted in the idea of re-educating the prisoners. The authorities in charge of penal policy postulated that idea as the aim of incarceration right in the first years after the establishment of the Soviet Union. The re-education in camps was supposed to be brought about by physical labor on the one hand and by what was called cultural education on the other. Cultural education was the responsibility of educational sections which had to be established in each camp and they existed under the authority of the Central Department of Cultural Education at the Gulag Main Administrative Office in Moscow, to which they had to report regularly on their work. These institutions, which were responsible for the official cultural related measures, were expected to organize activities of the prisoner's leisure time, or for the prisoner's leisure time, such as political education, alphabetization, anti-religious propaganda, etc., and various interest groups, for example, in literature, sports, and also music, including, for instance, instrumental and vocal ensembles and choirs. The music groups were subsumed under the term художественная самодеятельность, um, this is amateur art, a concept that was also of great importance in the big zone of the Soviet Union. Traces of Ukrainian music making within this ordered music life can already be identified in the first large concentration camp of the Soviet Union, which extended over the Solovki Islands in the White Sea. The Solovki camp published a periodical entitled Slon. This was an abbreviation of the camp's official name, Solovetsky Lagri Asobova Nazначenia. There one can read that December evenings with music and theater were held in 1924. In addition to a vocal trio, a piano trio, a pianist and individual singers, a Russian and a Ukrainian choir participated. The Ukrainian choir was conducted by a prisoner named Romashenko. Unfortunately, his first name is not mentioned there. At the beginning of the 19th 30s, the cultural re-education activity among the prisoners was renamed Perikovka, reforging. Perikovka was enforced in particular in the two large camps whose inmates had to build canals. The Belbaltlak, which was in charge of constructing the White Sea Baltic Canal from 1931 to 33, and the Dmitlak, whose inmates were deployed to build the Moskva-Volga Canal from 1932. In June 1933, the eponymous newspaper of these camps, Perikovka, reported on various music groups, among them a Ukrainian choir that had performed at a gathering of the, quote, best workers, end quote. Official musical activities were in particular good shape in the Dmitlak because there the composer Mikhail Chernyak served as music inspector during his prison term. Chernyak, a student of Belislav Yavorsky, hailed from Chernihiv. The push for musical activity in the Dmitlak is manifest in the regular organization of competitions, which were called Smotru Hudorstvene Samadietinesti, it is shows or literally masters of amateur art. There is no evidence of earlier such competitions in the Gulag, but later they were held in other camps as well. The first show took place on the 1st of July, 1933, in the city of Dmitrov, um, the site of Dmitlak's headquarters, 65 kilometers north of Moscow. 
Among those invited were so-called agitation brigades, troops of actors, musical ensembles and soloists, such as dancers, reciters, etc. Expressly encouraged was the participation of what was called Natsmene, references to whom are pervasive in Perikovka. The term Natsmene is an abbreviation for Nazionalne Menschinstva, it is national minorities. One we glean from the context of these articles that the term referred to nationalities living in the Southern Rep Republic of the Soviet Union. But sometimes, however, it was used for all non-Russian nationalities, so uh, for the Ukrainians too. Regarding the Natsmena, one Perikovka issue of July 1933 stated the following in an article that mentioned a Georgian dancing Elis Ginka, quote, in our camp, as in all of the Soviet Union, there is great opportunity for the development of national art, end of quote. This sounds like a mockery in view of the fact that national cultures were subject to Sovietization and that before long in the years 1937-38, arrests and executions would be ordered and carried out merely on the ground of a person's affiliation with a particular nationality. According to Perikovka, this newspaper, the first show of amateur art in the Dmitlak was preceded by preliminary rounds at the individual locations of the camp, which were known as camp points. The programs featured marches, waltzes, humorous songs, chistushki, folk songs, dances, and stories, choirs, orchestras of plucked string instruments, and other musical ensembles performed alongside individual inmates. The reports first and foremost praised music that was upbeat and gave an incentive to work. Mikhail Chernyak emphasized in an article that there were prisoners who played the bandura in the competition. He also mentioned that there were good choirs in the camp. However, he critically remarked that most of them exclusively sang Ukrainian folk songs. Chernyak called all choirs to follow the model of the choir of section number 10, which had performed both Ukrainian folk songs and, quote, revolutionary songs, end of quote. Two years later, in 1935, Chernyak again wrote in the camp press that choirs enjoyed special popularity among the Nazionale. It was the synonym of, for Natsmen. The Ukrainians, he continues, had the most choral ensembles, whose repertoire, in comparison with the previous year, had progressed much farther in the di direction of, uh, quote, new music, end of quote. Chernyak assumes that this repertoire had been, quote, born from the Soviet Ukraine of workers and farmers, end of quote, which allegedly found its expression in a great number of songs on the construction of the canal. Chernyak mentions a Ukrainian choir which performed uh, Natalka Poltavka, in Dmitrov with great success. Former Gulag prisoners have transmitted examples of how Ukrainian women were integrated in the official musical activities in the Gulag in the second half of the 1940s. The belly dancer Olga Ivanova was born in Lviv in 1928, arrested in July 1945, and sentenced to 10 years of imprisonment in 1946 uh, six, uh, for alleged treason against her homeland only because she had lived under German occupation. In June 1946, she was deported to the city of Magadan in the Far East, where she initially worked for three years in what was called the Central Cultural Brigade of the Maglak, the Magadan Correctional Labor Camp. The brigade was comprised of prisoners only and produced concerts as well as performances of operas and operettas, both for prisoners and for the free population of Magadan. In her written down recollections, Olga Ivanova mentions a very good mixed choir in the cultural brigade, whose members, however, were not exempt from enforced labor, but had to work with the common prisoners. Only for concerts, they were given leave. The members of the choir were first, first and foremost women from Western Ukraine and men from the Baltic states. The violinist Nadezhda Kravets, who prior to her 1949 arrest had played in the orchestra of the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, was convicted and then deported to a camp point of the Azerlak camp, appro approximately 100 kilometers from the town Taishet. Shortly after her arrival, there was a concert of amateur art in the clubhouse of that camp. 
The violinist was called to listen, but she declined, annoyed as she was, quote, how is that possible, end of quote. Concerts under the conditions of the camp were unthinkable to her first. At last she was talked into it, and when she entered the overcrowded, overcrowded clubhouse of the camp, she found that the action on the stage was unbelievable. Very young women in embroidered Ukrainian blouses and dark skirts sang with clear, bright voices and great enthusiasm, enthusiasm, quote, like the sky you are high, like the sea you are wide, immense path of use. <laughs> That was the song Maladjorna, a song of youth by Isaac Dunayevsky from Stalin's favorite film Volga Volga of 1938. When the violence heard this song, she was shocked and, quote, felt clearly that she had gone insane, end of quote. But later, she herself participated in amateur art because she had noticed that it was good both for the performing and the listeners in the listening presence. These examples demonstrate the intention of steering the original vocal culture of the, Ukraini of the Ukrainians towards officially approved paths in the Gulag. Folk songs were suppressed by the effort of cultural education and new songs confirming with Soviet ideology were requested. It is also known that during the deportation of Ukrainian prisoners in 1935, the guards on the trains did not allow them to sing folk songs while they were passing through Ukraine. And yet, many reports on Ukrainian prisoners singing their folk songs, both in concerts in, and in an unofficial context, are extant. Without be being prompted, many former Gulag prisoners expressly remembered the singing of Ukrainian prisoners in their memoirs and interviews and described the deep impression their singing made on them. Of any singing, that of Ukrainian inmates is mentioned by far most frequently in the recollections of former Gulag prisoners. Toward the end of the Second World War, an increasing number of prisoners from Western Ukraine and the Baltic states were sent to the Gulag. Many of them were anti-Soviet. In the underground, they agitated against the camp administrations and were able to resist, consequently, special camps with a proverbially um, strict regime were created in 1948 for, quote, particularly dangerous state criminals, end of quote, mostly political prisoners. While many Western Ukrainians and Bolts were sent there, this action could not prevent the emergence of strikes and uprisings in the Gulag in the first half of the 1950s. These strikes and uprisings, together with the fact that, Gulag, that the Gulag operated uneconomically, contributed to the collapse of the system. Such a special camp was the previously mentioned Ozerlak, where violinist Nadezhda Kravets was imprisoned. In her recollections, she writes about young daughters of the Banderovce, who were sent to children's homes at first and later sentenced to camp imprisonment just for being members of their families. According to Kravets, they stuck together as a closed group in the Ozerlak, worked hard, were very well behaved, and loved singing choral songs. Yuri Fidelgoitz, who later became known as a writer, was deported to Kolomai in 1950, after two years of imprisonment at the Ozerlak. He was sent to the Bierlak, which was also a special camp. There, Fidelgoitz worked as an enforced laborer in the munic municipality of Ustnera, about 900 kilometers northeast of Yakutsk, not far from Oymakon, the coldest permanently inhabited place on Earth. He was assigned to an industrial combine that included a mine and an ore processing plant and worked there in tungsten production in a humid, dark, and correspondingly scary environment. Spontaneously, he told me in an interview in Moscow in 2007 that the Ukrainians sang their folk songs as a choir when they worked, among them the Kovala Tosila Zuzula by Nishinsky um, on the Turkish captivity and the despite for the homeland. Wonderful songs and extraordinary, beautiful, 
And thus Fiedelgold described their singing nearly 60 years later. The civil employees of the company, young women and men, rushed to the site to listen. You now can hear the song uh, mentioned by Fiedelgold in the interpretation of a Ukrainian choir recorded in 1929 in Paris. The ethnologist Nina Gagin Torn, who served two prison terms in the Gulag, tells in her memoir how in the late 1940s and early 50s, women from Western Ukraine and the Baltic states clandestinely celebrated Christmas and Easter in small groups at the Tiemlak in Mordovia, which was also special camp from 1948. The Western Ukrainian women quietly sang Christmas carols generating a festive mood, and on Easter there were subdued but incessant singing all over the camp, Gagin Torn writes. The actress, singer, and translator Tatyana Lyshenko Suhamlina described in her memoir the celebration of Christmas Eve 1950 in a barrack in Vorkuta. Women from Western Ukraine sang sacred hymns in four parts without music. Everybody was silent and listened, even the worst career criminals. Because of a large number of musicians uh, who were imprisoned in the Gulag, I could mention many names of important uh, of imprisoned uh, Ukrainian musicians here. But because of the limited time, I would like to elaborate on one member of this group in lieu of all the others, the Ukrainian composer Taisya Shutenko, who was born in Kharkiv in 1905 and studied composition with Alexander Alexandrov and Nikolai Miskovsky at the Moscow Conservatoire from 1934 to 37. As a, quote, family member of a traitor of the fatherland, end of quote, she served a prison term as the Tiemlak mentioned before in Moldova from 1937 to 44. The actress and ballerina Ida Penzo, who was imprisoned together with Shutenka, communicated in a 1990 interview that the composer had written a symphony in the camp and sent it to Moscow without receiving a response. The composer's dictionary of Grigory Bernand and Alexander Daljansky of 1957 lists only one symphony among her works, with the composition date of 1936-37 and the title Karmiluk. It is possible that this is the symphony that Ida Penzo had in mind. Um, about Karmiluk, you know uh, uh, that he was a rebel standing up against Russian rule, and so I think um, that naming a symphony that was completed in a camp after him may count as an act of resistance. When speaking about uh, Ukrainian music in the Gulag, one should not forget about Vsevolod Zadiratsky, who was born in Rivne and composed uh, the 24 preludes in fugues in a small camp in Kalama in 1937-39 without access for, to a piano. Uh, which was a manifestation of mental strength in an inhuman environment. And he was already mentioned here. And uh, already mentioned here was uh, uh, Vasily Barvinsky too. Um, so I uh, go to my conclusion. Um, the study of utterances of Ukrainian musical culture in the Gulag has proven that inmates kept this culture alive despite attempts at assimilation and suppression and impressed other nationalities by doing so. Folk songs contributed to the preservation of the Ukrainian identity and the empowerment of Ukrainians as a group. In this way, the mental strength of the Ukrainians could be reinforced, which in combination with other factors contributed to the collapse of the Gulag system. These hypotheses are mostly based on the recollections of non-Ukrainians. You, um, had, uh, you, you had seen it. The next step should be a search for recollections of Ukrainian prisoners commenting on the singing of folk songs in the Gulag to test my hypothesis. Thank you very much for your attention.